Okay, so yeah, I created an acronym this morning. So this is for the welcome. So it's from the word welcome. So W is for willingly. We want to give our hearts to you, sorry. W is for willingly. We want to give our hearts to you, dear Lord. But at times we struggle. E is for elevating the many praises you deserve, Lord, just as the birds faithfully do it every day. L is for love, the only true God that never changes, showing us always what real love actually looks like. C is for Calvary, how you shed your innocent blood that can cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess our sins. O is for obedience, reminding us in the scripture that it is better to obey than to sacrifice. Help us to choose, O Lord, the right one first time. M is for mankind. Man not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. This is a gift. This day is a gift from you. What a mindful creator. And E is for Eden, where you want to take home your faithful children to live with you for eternity. So today, I hope we came empty to be filled by your Holy Spirit, dear God. Amen. 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 Very good. Amen. Okay, so next we're going to have our opening hymn, which is going to be hymn 185. Uh, if Sister Caroline, are you there, please? If you can sing the first two stanzas of this chorus for us, well, this hymn for us, please. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He is my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. My friend in trial so I go to him for blessings and he gives them more and all. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain, sunshine and rain. Harvest of grain, he is my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I, his friend deny, when he's so true to me? Following him, I know I'm right. He watches over me day and night. Following him by day and night, he is my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now, I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend, beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy, he's my friend. Amen. Amen. Now we're, going to amen, have, amen. now we're going to have the scripture reading, which will be taken by Elisha Barnett, who's going to be reading from Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 2. 
So Alicia will read the scripture reading, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 2. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. Amen. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. So now it's time for the young ones to come to the screen because this is your mini sermon for the day. So can all the children please come to the screen, please? Happy Sabbath, children. It's entitled God's Boxes. I have in my hand two boxes which God gave me to hold. He said, put all your sorrows into the black box and all your joys into the gold box. I heeded his words and in the two boxes, my joys and my sorrows I stored. But though the gold became heavier each day, the black box was as light as before. With curiosity, I opened the black box. I wanted to find out, find out why, and I saw in the base of the box a hole, which, which all my sorrows had fallen out by. I showed the hole to God and mused. I wondered where my sorrows could be. My child, they're all here with me. I asked God why he gave me the boxes. Why the gold and the black with the hole? My child, the gold is for you to count your blessings. And the black box is for you to let go. So the moral, children, of this story is that God wants us to hold onto our blessings and to let go of the things that hurt us. Can someone please find Matthew 11, verse 26? Amen. Thank you. And can someone please read Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30? It can be a young person or anyone. Matthew 11, 28 to 30? Yes. Okay, give me a second. Mm -hmm. and, and it reads, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden I give you is light. Amen. So as we can see, Jesus is encouraging each and every one of us, young and old, to take everything to him, and that we can count our blessings every day. Just as the song says, count your blessings every day. And that's what we are to do. Thank you. Um, that's the end of our children's story and um, will anyone like to say a prayer to close for us yes yeah, sure i'll pray Thank okay you. let's bow our heads <clears throat> dear heavenly father lord we thank you for giving us this wonderful sabbath day we thank you for giving us this time to spend with you lord we thank you for the moral of the story lord lord help us to count our blessings lord and give us strength to let go of our burdens and our trials, Lord. Give us strength and help us to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Okay, so thank you for that children's story.
reminding us that it's important to be grateful to many blessings that God constantly bestows upon us and that he doesn't want us to carry our burdens but to leave our burdens at the foot of the cross. So now we're going to have uh, the main prayer which will be led by Brother Marvin. So if we can take a reverend posture please as possible and Marvin will lead us into prayer to seek God. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for allowing us all to see another Sabbath and to congregate together to worship you. I ask you to be with the speaker today as we partake in the bread of life, Lord, which is your word. I ask you to help us to draw closer to you and enjoy the Sabbath day, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 So just before we go into the service, uh, we're going to go into the second hymn. So I just want the Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart what is your answer to him time after time he has waited before and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door oh how he wants to come in if you take one step toward the savior my friend you'll find his arms open wide receive him and all of your darkness will end within your heart he'll abide time after time he has waited and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door oh how he wants to come in amen Amen. Amen. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So thank you for that, Auntie Ruth. And I hope everyone was singing around, singing along. But if not, I hope you. Well, I know you were blessed listening to the rendition. So uh, today we have our very own young man that's grown into a bigger man that has many and many him. Our very own pastor. Anderson West. <laughs> you know, he's not a pastor. It just slipped out of my mouth, but maybe you should be a pastor in the future. <laughs> no, but uh, we look forward to seeing what God is going to speak through you for us and for yourself. You know, it's uh, an important work and it's a privilege that God uses us even in our conditions, you know, to bring a message to help us realize our need of Him. So may God bless you. May God continue to speak through you as we listen to what he has prepared for you. So over to you, Brother um, Alda Anderson West. Good morning, church. Um, it's good to see everyone here today. Um, yeah, thank you, Craig, for that. Not pastor, no, 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 just, 
just Zelda, just Zelda for now. Um, and it's, it's good to yeah see so many faces, you know, from church. Um, but then also to see uh, family from both across the pond and down, down south, uncles and aunties, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for coming and mom, dad, I know it's early morning. So I thank you for, for joining. Um, but, and, and, and good friends as well. Andy, it's good to see you. Uh, thank you for, for joining today. Before I start today, I just want to have a word of prayer to bring in uh, the service, or to bring in the sermon. Dear Lord, I ask you to be, to guide my mouth, guide my mind, guide my heart as I deliver your words, not mine, your words. Thank you for an opportunity to do your work again, Lord. But please be with me today and be with us as a church. And may be your Holy Spirit dwell within each and every one of our hearts. I pray in your name. Amen. You know, I must say, you know, the, the weather this morning, it's, it's beautiful up here. Nice and sunshine. It's like, you know, all the news this week about when this thing might end. It's like there's a new optimism in the air. So, you know, and hopefully a few months time we'll be able to be each other with each other in church and, and be able to dwell there. But, you know, we'll see. We can only pray. So the title of my sermon today is Stop That Thief. It was a warm January day back in Florida. The school had started back after Christmas break. It was an excellent Christmas break slash birthday for me, being a Boxing Day baby. After asking for two years straight, I finally got the gift I wanted, a Nintendo Game Boy Color. I can remember it like yesterday when I opened the box. My dad is a skeptic of video games and had been reluctant to get it. But after getting excellent grades and being, I like to say, a good son, I was able to, my, he and my mother got me a clear purple one. The clear purple was a bit of a girly color, but I thought to myself, who cares? I finally got my Game Boy. I was excited to take it to school and show my friends and play it on breaks. I can't remember if my parents said not to take it to school or not, but I did anyway. We were on a lunch break and I showed it to a few of my friends and a couple of the other kids I gathered, I gathered around. It was nothing spectacular, just a bunch of 10 and to 11 year olds looking at a Game Boy. But as we lost track of time, the bell rang. It was time to go to the next lesson. So I put my Game Boy away in my backpack and rushed off to class. I kept my bag for me, with me for the rest of the day. Fast forward toward the end of the school day, and I was waiting for my brother and mother to pick me up. So I thought I'd get my Game Boy out to pass the time. But when I looked in my backpack, it was gone. No one knew I had brought it with me except my friends and those other kids who were watching me play. I quickly ran to my friends and asked me, uh, who were with me, and asked them if they saw it. They were shocked and said no, and they even emptied their backpacks. I didn't ask them to, the teachers did. The only other kid that was with us that didn't do that was Marlon. Marlon, a kid who was always being reprimanded by teachers and seemed to have his own special spot in the principal's office after school. But conveniently this day, Marlon had left early. He was the only other person that knew I even brought it with me. And I realized he was the only person that would attempt to take it. He came to school the next day looking smug. And when questioned, he said, I didn't even, he didn't even know I had a Game Boy. Long story short, he finally admitted he took it, but I never got it back. It would take a year, another year before I got another Game Boy. And let me say, I didn't take it out of my house for a very long time. Thou shall not steal. Church, there is nothing more frustrating or anger inducing than an individual taking something that someone else had worked hard to earn simply because they want it. Sadly, however, it's rife in our, for our world today. Whether it's the telephone scangers calling you up and scaring people into giving their life savings, or identity thieves who are siphoning from some bank accounts, or burglars 
who steal precious possessions or the so-called investors who prey on naive customers. Deception and theft are everywhere. It's not funny and it's not smart, and for me, it's a big reason why our society is full of mistrust and apathy, because simply, you can't trust anyone. And it seems anyone who's anyone wants to take the shortcut to wealth and prosperity. And for many, stealing is the quickest way there. But what drives a person to steal? And are we blameless? A verse that is always stuck out to me and I found interesting over the years is Proverbs 30, verse seven to nine. A young King Solomon says in all his wisdom this, two things I have required of thee, deny me not, deny them, deny me them before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies and give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full. And deny, and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of God, if my God in vain. We see Solomon has a simple but poignant idea. He doesn't want to be too rich that he doesn't feel he needs to rely on God. And he doesn't want to be so poor that stealing is only his only way out of poverty. Solomon has a way of cutting straight to the chase. Theft and other crimes, for many, seem to be the best option to survive daily. I'm rubbish at buying coats. They're either too small or too thin or waterproof or aren't waterproof or I have to double up. With my job, I'm, all, I'm out filming all over the UK in all different types of weather conditions. So a good coat is key to my ability to film and function in winter and fall. So my lovely wife, Susan, went with me to the store and helped me pick out the perfect coat. It was warm, breathable, had loads of pockets. And if you ask me, it didn't look too shabby either. And best of all, it was on sale. That coat saw me through thick and thin, but I have a terrible habit. I like to leave my car, my coat in the car at night. My logic is, well, it's there when I need it and I'll never forget it. Because we all know in England, you can have four seasons in one day. And in all my years of leaving the coats and jacket in my car, I had not one incident and it always been there. But one morning that was particularly cold, I rushed out and got in my car only with a light jumper on, because, you know, expecting my coat to be there because, you know, it always had been. But when I looked in my back seat, it was gone. Oh, I must have brought it back inside the night before. So I rushed back inside to look in the coat rack and it wasn't there. So I thought, okay, Sue must have put it in the, in the wash. So I left for work. And the evening I got back and asked Susan what she did with the coat. She replied, I haven't seen it in weeks because you always leave it in your car and it dawned on me someone had gone in my car and taken my coat because silly me i didn't lock my car that night i was fuming not only did they take my precious coat but my gloves and hat that were in the pocket and not to mention one of my, my favorite oakland raiders hoodie the nerve of them i thought who steals a coat? I mean, come on. In my heart, I was disgusted and ripped them off. And I would tell everyone about how disgusted I was that someone would steal a coat. Who does that? But talking to my friend's dad, he made a good point. He said, imagine that person didn't have a coat and it was freezing. They had no heating at their home and they couldn't afford to buy one. And for someone, because for someone to take a coat, they had to be desperate. They had to have no option. You see, the link between poverty and crime has long been established. No matter where you are in the world, if the area is poorer, you feel that there actually is a higher chance of being a victim of criminal activity. Whether it's the ghettos of the United States or the shanty towns in parts of South America or parts of Africa, 
or the council estates of Britain. If you don't live in these area, areas, you actively avoid them. And I'm all been, I've all, I'm all sure we've been, I'm sure we've all been told at one some point or another, you don't go down there, you'll get something nicked, whether it's told in jest or not. But before we leave this Zoom today thinking that I'm, I'm, I'm having a larger indictment of poor people everywhere, hold your horses. There is a larger evil at play here. There is something that we are all guilty of. Who here is familiar with the phrase, in li with, the, with the quote, in life there are winners, there are losers, and there are people who have not learned how to win. Many play this life like a game or a competition in which only first place matters and winner takes all. Survival of the fittest. Today we see the society is most divided, not just by political party or race or beliefs, but by haves and haves not. While our faith gives us a purpose for our life in trying to bring as many people to the beautiful love we have in Jesus, in a sense, trying to get as many people to join you in eternity with Christ. On the flip side, the wider world is about getting yours first and forgetting everyone else. Now, I don't wanna to get too far into covetousness because someone else will preach about that. But the reality is people constantly feel they don't have enough. They want more and they will do anything to get it. And if you aren't a go-getter, you'll be left behind. And those who are left behind are left to feed on the scraps. And after a while, people are tired of feeding on scraps and people do desperate things. In Leviticus 19, verse 13, Moses is written down, you shall not oppress the poor. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him, sorry. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night, un all night until the morning. During this pandemic, we've seen millions of people around the world losing their jobs, watching their savings go up in flames. But in that time, the world's mega rich those, ex those in the exclusive billionaires club who are, who are less than three, who in total are less than 3,000 people have added, hold it for it, $10 trillion. Yeah, I didn't make that up. $10 trillion to their wealth. That's 3,000 people with more wealth than all of the world's countries not name the United States and China. And get this, that 25 trillion was only an additional 25% of their existing wealth. Astronomical numbers. I can't even think about it. Who needs that much money, right? Now, I'm not here to try and inspire the next Russian revolution or anything silly like that. But many of the companies of the mega rich that they own had either depressed the wages of their workers or even made thousands redundant, all while they were able to bet in the stock markets, buy failing companies, and increase their excessive wealth. We often interpret stealing as taking something that's not ours, but the Bible clearly states that stealing is when we don't give people what is rightfully theirs, when we don't respect someone and appropriately compensate people for their work and time, and we pocket the savings from not having to make that outlay, that is very much a sin. But this isn't only the dealings of billionaires. How many of us, while on holiday, have bartered with a local market seller in a third world country, getting them to lower their asking price down, knowing full well that extra five or 10 pounds won't really make much of a difference to us. But that same five pounds could be the difference between that seller feeding their family for that week. Or put it like this, could you imagine going to Aldi or Tesco and bartering with the checkout person and asking them for a discount and not judging and not budging until you get one? Or even when we barter a trade person's down for their work, 
but it also works in reverse. How many people in this world praise pulling a fast one and making loads of profit for little work, leaving a customer not knowing that they've been ripped off or missing a few bits in your taxes or downloading that film for free or using that illegal software or <clears throat> watching a football, a football stream for free when we know full well it should cost. I'm sure we've all been there or lying about your situation to get a bit more benefits. The fact is, whether we like it or not, it's all stealing, it is all dishonesty, and it is all ungodly. And it's put quite bluntly here in Proverbs 17, bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward, afterward his mouth will be full of gravel. Short-term gain equals long-term loss. And in this case, this case, the short-term is this life on earth, and the long-term is eternity with Christ. Is it really worth missing out on eternity for a few extra quid in your pocket? Of course not. Look, but I'm a realist. People need to make money to live. People need a fair wage. But in this almost constant search for more and more profit, people have become more and more desperate. People who even started out with honest intentions have been corrupted. Let's look at the account of Jesus throwing the buyers and sellers out of the temple. And I'll read Matthew's account in Matthew 21, 12 to 13. And Jesus went into the temple and cast them all out, and cast all, cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the ta overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, "It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves." The disrespectful and irreverent actions of these buyers and sellers a reminder that in the pursuit of money, nowhere is safe, not even God's temple. Sister White comments in the Desires of Ages that the, about this saying, the dignitaries of the temple engaged in buying and selling and the exchange of money. So completely were they controlled by their greed of gain that in the sight of God, they were no better than thieves. These sellers had become so blind to their action, it took the Son of God to shake them out of their dishonest practices. But I've got a question. Do you think those sellers in the temple that made Jesus so angry had always disrespected the, the temple, had always disrespected God's house? Maybe at one time they were simple farmers providing to their mind an honest service. Do you think that they were always so ruthless that they were always going to be selling the temple itself? Or perhaps in the search of profit in a crowded marketplace, they became more and more desperate. Desperate. I can only speculate, but in a culture that glorifies wealth above all else, can we really say we never stoop so low? It is easy for us to wash our hands of the guilt by justifying our actions and by convincing ourselves we aren't stealing, that we're sticking it to the man, or that the costs are expensive and they aren't fair. And that, like I mentioned before, we are in an unfair situation. But the Bible mentions this in Proverbs 6, 30 to 31. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry, but if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold and he will give all the goods of his house. So the Bible doesn't say here, oh, it's okay. He was poor. He needed it. He's exempt. I mean, we all love Robin Hood, the story, but stealing is still stealing. Well, the Bible, Bible is clear here. There is mercy. There is empathy. You know, he's not being put to death but there is still a punishment. And 
if I bring it to modern day, being hungry isn't the same as wanting to avoid giving 20% to the government or watching a movie on a Cody box. But I don't want us to miss the point of these examples and anecdotes. The fact is, stealing starts in the heart. It starts with greed. It's a lack of contentment. But we can also be responsible for causing others to steal. Poverty and inequality in wealth, resources and opportunity is something we as followers of Christ just can't ignore. Objectively, we are blessed to live in the fifth richest nation on this planet with a robust welfare system and a great health service and housing for most people. But for many, that isn't enough. We need more, we desire more, and we can't be satisfied. And while we have this desire, we ignore the needs of those around us. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the face and pierced themselves with many pangs. First Timothy 6, 9, and 10. What is being rich? Is it being able to afford a new Mercedes every year or owning a home in Britain, in Spain, in Wales at the same time? Or being able to invest thousands and millions on the stock market or having a yacht in the Mediterranean? How about this? If you have a roof on your head and a fridge full of food and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the world's population. And get this, if you have money in your bank account and spare change in your pocket, you are in the world's richest 8%. It's funny that we often look at the privileged, overindulgent rich as someone else, someone better off than us, than us. But to many, we are the rich. Church, this love of money is driving the world mad and is driving many of us to steal in many ways to get ahead. And if we don't steal ourselves, many of the items we own or the bargains we get is because someone down the line didn't get what was owed to them or didn't even know what they were selling was worth anything. As we crave the material, we lose the spiritual. And Jesus advised his disciples to do this after telling the parable of the rich fool, which you should read in your own time, in Luke 12. That's what Jesus said in Luke 12, 33 and 34. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and moth can destroy. For where your treasure is, you know the rest, there your heart will be also. Well, we may not have to sell our homes and our cars at this exact moment or anything like that. What God is telling us here is not to be tethered to the things of this world, to seek to help those around us, to truly be a good neighbor to those around us. And we see, when we see those suffer, people suffering, not all walk over them and ignore them in their time of need. Let us not exploit those who are more unfortunate, unfortunate than us. Because as our scripture reminds us and says so poignantly, better is a poor man who walks in integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Sorry, not scripture yet. But we may never be millionaires by the West, by Western standards, but we are already rich men and women to so many in the world. But as we go about our daily lives, we must ask ourselves, are we crooked in our ways? Are we so eager to get by that we ignore those around us? Or worse, are we dishonest in our pursuit of wealth or just getting by? 
By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does, God, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. 1 John 3, 16 to 18. That coat, no matter how nice, will fade. That brand new car will fade. That lovely home will rot one day. And that money in our account will go. But the love of Christ will never fade. What Christ has in eternity for us will never fade. But also, some need our help on earth right now. And as followers of Christ, our lives are supposed to be about service. Service to those in need. To help them and to show people what the love of Christ truly is. Let us remember... I didn't let us remember that stealing starts in our hearts. When we set our sights down on this world and its wealth that rots and rusts. But when we focus on what's above, what Christ wants us to do, when we are more focused on fulfilling God's will with love, we may find ourselves poor by the world standards. But as Jesus told his disciples, we gain money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fall and where no fee thief approaches and no moth destroys. Church, family, and friends, if you, want, if you want to not just focus on this world, if you want to focus on Christ alone so that not only will we cease to lie, cheat, and steal, but we'll be transforming into a being of love, a being of love, with a love that comes from understanding that the commandments aren't there to stop us from living, but to give us life more abundantly, to help us live a life that not only draws us close to Christ, but a life where our purpose is to seek and help all of those around us. If you want that renewed heart, that renewed spirit and renewed love that only Christ can give, please bow your head as you pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for, I thank you for life. I thank you for your love and I thank you for your commandments. Lord, when we hear thou shalt not steal, we often think we are, that doesn't apply to us because we never would take anything that's not ours. But so often we're stealing others' time, others' resource, and we're stealing moments that we should be spending with you. Lord, I ask you to give us change our hearts that we may focus on you and you alone and not the things of this world that rots and rusts. But we focus on the riches that are in heaven and that riches is your love and your everlasting peace and glory that you will give each and every one if, of us if we accept it. Lord, I ask you to help us to do more to help those in need whether it's a church brother or sister or a neighbor or someone on the street, Lord, there's so many people right now that need our help, especially during this pandemic when so many people have suffered. Please help us to do more, to be active, active Christians, not just doers of the word. So you see, not just speakers of the word, but doers of the word. May they know that you are a God of love through the actions that you inspire us to do. I ask and I pray this in your wonderful and precious name, Lord, and that you also you bring us closer as a church, that again, we may know that ne you neither, none of us need anything, that we are always there to help each other, that we are there to pick each other up even when we're falling down, Lord. Please, I ask this and I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So going to have the closing hymn and Bruce is just going to play that for us now. Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray Come Jesus, come Let today be the day 
Sometimes I feel like I'm gonna break, but I'm holding on to a hope that won't fade. Come, Jesus, come. We've been to face come and lay it all down cause it might be today the time is right now there's no need to wait your past will be won Rivers of grace Come Jesus, come as we go about our, our, our lives, Lord, sometimes we get so busy 
that we forget this world isn't our home, that the things of this world aren't really for us, Lord, that they're just there to distract us from being closer to you. Lord, we need you in every moment of our lives. I need you right now. I need, we all need you right now, Lord. You know, with, we, sometimes we just get full of the distractions and full of the temptations and full of the sadness when we know this world's going to be sad because it's fallen. But we also need to be hopeful and be full of hope and look forward to your return in which you'll cleanse this earth, Lord. You will take us to be with you where we will experience a, a, a love that we can't even imagine now. But Lord, we have a work to do because there are so many who have no idea what your love is and what you are promising them. Let each and every one of us come closer to you and radiate that love that we may show more people, not just in a passive way, but in an active way, what your love is about and why, you're, and why you will return and why you will take us back with you if we accept you. I ask you to be with each and every one of us, Lord. Keep us safe throughout these weeks in our daily lives. But let us always remember to keep that hope of your return and your return will be soon. We know that COVID has seen us so isolated and divided, but we know that if we stay close to you, we will stay united in purpose and united in love. Please guide us each and every day, Lord, so we, we can have a treasure in heaven of a life with you for all eternity. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.